it's great to welcome you all here to our 50th anniversary birthday party. Thank you, everybody. I heard those names. We're 50 years further along in the journey from chattel to full respect as equals. A muddy road leading to equal rights, equal pay, and equal opportunity for all women. What a different world we live in. How vast and unexpected the changes. What wonders have come through improvements in science, medicine, art, and lifestyle in that time. And yet there are still so many miles ahead. The present has not kept its promises to many. There is no paradise for those who live in poverty. Those who live with abusive relationships, those who find gender a barrier to advancement. Their tears are our nourishment. Struggles like ours take time and energy and new blood. The fight for women started for women on Vermont jury started in 1923. We were told that families would be hurt if this was allowed, and women would be harmed by what they heard in the courtroom. The law changed following a referendum vote in 1942. Vermont women began the fight to gain full citizenship in the 1880s, claiming the right to vote in local and state elections. It took nearly 40 years and a federal constitutional amendment to achieve that victory. Just this January, the historic fight for equal pay, flexible working hours, and job equality took effect. Some of you may know that Governor Shumlin uh, signed the bill yesterday, which we were so happy to be there. <laughs> If we were to abolish sex discrimination and recognize that women are at least equal to men, that fight must continue. My time on the commission through three governors has been an enriching and enlightening experience. I have felt the strength of sisterhood, and I have discovered over and over that what we dream can come true, as long as we can stay focused. Change is hard. Tradition is often an excuse for not changing. Yet we must be patient, we must be smart, and we will prevail. Because there are no more excuses, the old ways are passing fast. What was always true is now only beginning to be understood. This world works when it does because of women. And not just as wives, mothers, grandmothers, but because we are different from men. And in many ways, men have suffered by being left on their own to run the world. <laughs> History shows that a man-centered universe is only half done, lopsided, self-indulgent, undisputed, disciplined and capable of real compassion and very lonely. It's our turn. 50 years is just a snap on this journey. Thank goodness there's a commission on women. Let it last until its work is done. It's my great privilege to introduce our president, Marsha Merrill, to you. And I just have to say how great it is to be in this room with so many old friends. Thank you. Hi everyone, sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, uh, some of our people who are supposed to speak are not quite ready, so uh, <laughs> if, if, uh, if I may beg your indulgence uh, after Marion's wonderful remarks, I would invite all of you to uh, mix a little bit and then we will uh, find our speakers and re reconvene. Does that meet your approval? All right, thank you. Oh, and then in the cafeteria.
So glad to see so many people here today. I'm Marsha Merrill. I'm chair of the Vermont Commission on Women. And uh, I thank everyone for joining us today. Celebrate 50 years of the progress of, by the Vermont Commission on Women. I thought this morning about 50 years of the Vermont Commission, and it occurred to me that as I look across the United States today, there are many states that no longer have a Commission on Women, and that in Vermont, we are very fortunate to have had the support of governors and our legislatures going back 50 years to make us, I think, a really important part of what goes on in Vermont, and I'm so grateful for that. Now I'm going back to my notes. <laughs> and I'm also pleased to be a part of a distinguished line of commissioners, going back to our guest today, Governor Kunin, who was on the first Commission on Women group of commissioners to be appointed. And I'm so grateful to Governor Hoff for starting the commission in 1964 and to Governors Davis, Salmon, Snelling, Cunin, Dean, Douglas, and Shumlin for supporting the commission's work every year since then. We're very honored today to be joined by many of those commissioners over the last 50 years. And if you look around the room, you'll see some people with flowers pinned to their jackets that look very much like this. To let you know they served on the commission, wave everybody. Come on. I'm so glad there's so many of you here today. And we're also honored to be joined by lots of former staff as well as many members of organizations that have served on our advisory council over the years. But I would like to draw attention to our former staff. Uh, where are you in the room? Would you stand up? Judith, there you are. Stand up, please. <laughs> Thank you for coming. The commission's work has always been about collaboration. And we've always relied on our partners around the state to advance rights and opportunities for women. And we've been so fortunate to have such a strong partner in our current governor. Governor Shumlin has been a champion for equal pay, the fight against domestic and sexual violence, and women's leadership. Unfortunately, he had a last minute schedule change and is unable to join us today but he has sent Allie Richards to speak on his behalf. Allie. Hi, everyone. It's an honor to have be pinch hitting in this room in front of all of you. Who I, I've worked closely with many of you. 50 looks good. It looks really good. Um, the governor wishes he uh, could be here, but he actually had a pressing family matter. Um, that he had to attend to, and uh, he has made my job somewhat easy, uh, as he, this is his issue. He, uh, as many of you know, equal pay, early childhood, renewed focus that I've been working uh, on for the past year and a half uh, at his request. Um, appointments to key staff, cabinet. Uh, it was hard to pick who would come over here from his staff since there are so many women. Uh, his chief of staff, Liz Miller, um, and um, many cabinet appointments, judges, Beth Robinson, uh, C. Deb Markowitz. Um, so just the importance of making sure that uh, women continue to serve um, these positions. Um, he also, when asked uh, why has he made this his issue, he says, he has had a very, very strong mother. And now I have two daughters. Um, this, we have accomplished a lot. Uh, looking out on this crowd, you can see why. Um, and uh, he also wishes he could have been here today, staying with Governor Cunin, 
uh, who you'll hear from, and uh, but we have a lot of work left to do. And he will continue to be a partner, and thanks you all so, so much for your dedication and commitment to this crucial matter for us, and for our kids, uh, and for the state. So thank you very, very much on his behalf. Thank you, Allie. And now I'm very pleased to announce another governor, the first and still only female <laughs> governor of Vermont, who continues to be one of the strongest voices for women's econo economic equity and women's full participation and leadership, both in and out of the political arena. Governor Madeline Kuhn. We're very honored to have you here shakers are here, past, present, and future. And uh, I'm delighted to be part of this celebration today. Let me assure you, I was a very young woman 50 years ago. <laughs> uh, and actually, um, it was Phil Hoff who appointed me, thanks to somebody who probably is not in your memories, uh, Ben Collins, and I was friendly with Ben Collins's wife, and that's how it happened. It was my first political thing. Um, but I have somewhere, and I couldn't dig it out of the piles I have, or the files I have, uh, a photo that uh, when we were first formed, we all the chairs of the commissions were invited, invited to the White House and LBJ was president, and we were welcomed in the Rose Garden. And what I remember most, which tells you how long ago it was, LBJ started telling stories about the Vietnam War and how difficult it was for him to write letters to the families of those who died. So it was an interesting, historic moment. Uh, we didn't know then, what we know now, that women would make so much progress. Um, I actually ended up writing the Vermont Commission report, and I had to get a babysitter so I could go to my neighbor's house <laughs> so I could write the report. Um, maybe it's in your archives. Um, I'm not sure it's worth reading again, but it would give us a point of reference in history so I look back fondly that the commission, is, as you have just said, has survived, where in many other states it has not. It has also had some tumultuous times in Vermont. Uh, I remember a time when I was lieutenant governor, and uh, there was a fish and game bill on the floor. It was about the six-inch trout. And the people, you know, whether they had to throw it back or not, I'm not an expert, but there was a, a really heated debate about the six inch trout. And just before them, they had cut the money for the Commission on Women in, in the Senate. And I, I think it was, I can't remember whether it was the House or the Senate. And it was towards the end of the session where you know you suspended the rules all the time because you want to get the bill passed and time is running out, where suddenly the women got together and they refused to suspend the rules on the six inch trip. <laughs> survived. So I guess we should learn something. We have to play politics the same way they do. And that is how we prosper. That is how change takes place. 
And you know, so much has happened in Vermont in terms of legal rights. And you know, I remember a big thing, and I'm not sure if it was the commission, but there was a time when women's spouses' names were not in the phone book. And we saw that as a big victory, getting a name in the phone book. And I see some heads nodding who remember those days. So there were lots of changes. Probably the most dramatic two are the education of women and women in the labor force. And yesterday, President Obama again brought up the whole question of equal pay. And Vermont has done better than some states. There's a great equal pay law that was passed last session, which I think should be publicized. It does something that Obama mentioned yesterday. It says you can talk about your salary. And those of you who are familiar with the Lily Ledbetter case know that's why she was underpaid, because she didn't know that the guys doing the same job that she did were paid considerably more. So in Vermont, it is now possible to talk about your salary, yeah. to ask for, for, for your neighbor's salary. So we should publicize, we should publicize this. So 70 cents on the dollar. I think in the old days, when we first started keeping the statistics, it was 59 cents on the dollar. We had little buttons that said 59 cents, um, which work to get us to 77. <laughs> but let's face it, we got to get to 100%. Yeah. There's no excuse. So we do have to get there. It's great that women are in the labor force in great numbers, but it's hard often when you don't have national or state policies to help you. I won't go into greater detail, but it's hard with an old habit of public speaking. Um, <laughs> and, uh, next year, we're going to get paid sick days. Yeah. Yeah. It's a health issue, it's an economic issue, and it's not only a women's issue, it's a family issue, and it's a children's issue. So we still have a ways to go to get paid family and medical leave, to get affordable quality childcare for all Vermont families. So we've done half the job. We've become educated, we've become employed, we've become confident, we're doing things our mothers and grandmothers never dreamed of doing. But we have to move the next step. And that means we have to, again, become activists. Not only to move forward, but I'm sorry to say, to hold on to what we thought we had for sure. I only need to mention one word, contraception. I didn't think that in the year 2014, we would have to have a Supreme Court determine whether you can have access to contraception depending on who your employer is, not who your doctor is, not who you are. So the passion that started the Commission on Women is still there. And I know you're nonpartisan, but these issues should be bipartisan because they are about the quality of life in America, about the quality of our families, and the future of our children. So thank you, Commission, for what you've done, and go for it in the future. say it better. And uh, all of our congressional delegation from Washington have sent words today and representatives. And uh, Senator Leahy has sent uh, Diane to speak with us. So here she is.
So I'm really glad to be here as a member of the commission, and I have been for some time, but I'm also specifically today proud to be here to bring Bernie's wishes. And I will, you know, I won't repeat the history, which you've heard from President Kennedy and Governor Hoff and the people who started it here. Um, and the other thing, um, you know, is I won't repeat too much that we have a long way to go. We've done a lot of really good work, and we have a long way to go. Uh, specifically, yesterday, you know, was Equal Pay Day, and they were they're still the Senate working on the Paycheck Fairness Act. It's pretty appalling that they are working on the Paycheck Paycheck Fairness Act still, but we hope that that goes, and certainly our senators support it strongly. Vermont, in this letter, has been a, Vermont's been a leader on the issue of equal pay for women, as well as on the issues of reproductive rights civil unions and gay marriage and health care. And all along the way, the Vermont Commission on Women has played an important role in these advances for Vermont families. We should be enormously proud that here in Vermont, we have outstanding women leaders, like Governor Madeline Kunin, who continues to encourage women to participate at all levels of government. Marion Milne, who courageously voted for civil unions at great political cost. State Senator Sally Fox. And, and State Senator Sally Fox, who spent her entire career speaking up for vulnerable Vermonters. 
Those of us who work in the Congress and in the state government are inspired by these Vermonters and many others who work for equal rights and social justice. I'm pleased to congratulate the Vermont Commission on Women on your 50th anniversary and look forward to continuing to work with you to advance women's rights in the coming years. Keep up the good work. Sincerely, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Thank you, Gretchen, and thank you, Senator Sanders. Uh, Tricia, there you are. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. My name is Tricia Coates, and I'm here on behalf of Congressman Peter Welch, and it is an honor to be here representing him um, to celebrate this wonderful anniversary. And he did send words, and I will uh, condense those. <laughs> um, I don't always do that. Uh, it is no coincidence that the Commission's 50 years align with the most significant years of progress for women across the nation. This progress has required steady advocacy, a push to end discrimination in all corners, a voice for equality in all communities, attention paid to women's health. Under the Commission's leadership, our public policies, our institutions, our communities all reflect real progress in the realization of equality and opportunity for women. Governor Hoff said when creating the commission, if you do not get the maximum out of members of a society, the society is failing our members. This is reflected in your 50 years of work, and today your advocacy remains just as crucial to Vermont. A young Vermont woman must approach her future knowing that her gender will not hinder her pursuit of an education. She has a right to know that she will compete on an equal playing field for a good job and fair pay. She must be confident that her reproductive freedom will not be a matter for others to determine, that she will have recourse when faced with injustice and influence over policies that affect her, that Vermont will provide a safe and supportive future. We will continue to rely on the Commission to lead us toward this even brighter future for Vermont women. My sincere thanks for all you do for our state. Sincerely, Peter Welch. Thank you for the thanks to uh, Congressman Welch. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the Executive Director of the Commission on Women, Carrie Brown. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm so happy that you're here. Um, you know, I have the very best job ever in the history of jobs on planet Earth, and I'm so appreciative to be able to surround myself with the amazing people on the staff, the amazing commissioners, and all of the people who came before us, and the 50 years worth of work and history and legacy that you've given us. It's just tremendous. Thank you all so much. Uh, I just want to, some of you, Probably all of you have seen the slideshow in the card room, so you've gotten a little sense of some of the stuff that's in our history, but I want to point out a few highlights uh, from the past 50 years, so we can just brag a little bit. Uh, so, for instance, some of the things that the Commission has had a hand in are successfully advocating to require insurers to provide maternity coverage the same way that they do other kinds of medical expenses, spearheading along with the State Labor Council, an amendment to Vermont's Parental and Family Leave Act, allowing for short-term family leave, which is the first legislation in the country allowing for this. And I'm actually not really sure what the other states have, but I think it's still fairly unusual. Um, establishing the, the Vermont Women's History Project, which is now housed at the Vermont Historical Society and has an amazing collection of women from throughout Vermont's history and their work and their art and their writing, and it's all in this beautiful website that you can now go and look through and read all about them. Ensuring that nursing mothers have a private place and time to express breast milk for a nursing child at their workplace, which I can tell you from personal experience is very useful. <laughs> <laughs> Successfully advocating for the passage of Vermont's Equal Pay Act, 
ensuring employees do the same job, receive the same pay, regardless of gender. And then also working in coalition with a lot of folks in this room last year to help pass an amendment to that act, which not only, as Governor Kunin mentioned, makes it easier for people to talk about how much money they make, but it also grants employees the right to request flexible working arrangements. And we are the first state in the country to do this. So that's, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> So we know, of course, as everyone has said, that we can't take this all for granted and that we know that there's plenty of work to be done. We know there's still a wage gap. We're still not at a dollar for every dollar that men earn. We know that women are still missing out on opportunities in science, math, engineering, technology, education, and careers. We know that women are just dismally underrepresented in leadership roles, particularly in corporate America, where something like 4.3% of the women on the Fortune 100 boards are, uh, people on the boards are women. And then we know that as long as so many women are enduring domestic and sexual violence, so many women are experiencing human trafficking and sexual harassment, that there's still work that has to be done. In 1963, the President's Commission on the Status of Women issued a report to President Kennedy where they made some recommendations. And um, I just want to read you a little description that they put in there of what life was like for women then, their perception of what life was like. Today's image of young married women is very different. It shows suburban mothers reading directions on packages or cans as they cook frozen or otherwise pre-processed food by gas or electricity. <laughs> To buy it, they bundle the children into the car and set forth to market at the local shopping center. They make the rounds from supermarket to five and 10, from drugstore to branch department store. The appeal to the modern young housewife of instant coffee and minute rice is a vivid indication that time is always short. Perhaps that is why her hair is short. Her dresses are short. At home or at play, she's likely to wear shorts. And on occasion, her temper is short too. Oh, no. <laughs> so that aside, that was really just in there for entertaining purposes. <laughs> the report included a lot of recommendations that uh, sound a little too familiar today, actually, such as strengthening counseling and education services for women and girls so that they can enter a wide range of careers and so they can re-enter the workforce after having children. Uh, they also recommended that paid maternity leave should be provided to all women, 1963. And they recommended that women should be encouraged to seek elective and appointed posts at all levels of government and all branches of government. And they also included a recommendation that a Know Your Rights pamphlet should be published to enable more women, women to become aware of their legal position. And I'm happy to say, as I'm sure you all know, that we have our Legal Rights of Women in Vermont publication that we renew periodically, and we've been publishing it for years that does exactly that. I'm just so pleased that Vermont places such high value on advancing rights and opportunities for women, and that so many of you here today have worked so hard to keep that work going. And to celebrate 50 years of work and accomplishments, I can't think of anything better than birthday cake. <laughs> <laughs> so we are all done with talking at you, and we are now ready to serve you cake and treats. Thank you all so much for coming.